Mr. Mr. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure of introducing to you the distinguished speaker of this evening, Professor Neil Srelu. Dr. Rowling is a senior lecturer and former head of the Department of Extension Science at the Agriculture University, Wageningen in the Netherlands. In 1963, Dr. Rowling received his MSc in Rural Sociology from Agriculture University, Wageningen. In 1970, he received his PhD in Communications from Michigan State University, East Lansing, Michigan. In, from 65 to 67, Dr. Rowling served as a project leader of the AID research project on the diffusion of innovations in rural societies in eastern Nigeria. From 73 to 78, as an associate professor at the Department of Extension Education, Agriculture University, Wageningen, Dr. Rowling chaired a committee to develop extension training programs for developing countries. From 81 to 84, he was the director of extension education at Agriculture, Edu um, Agriculture Center, Agriculture University, Wageningen. From 83 to 89, he served as professor in another department at the same university. Throughout this period, Dr. Rowling has conducted international development assignments for USAID, FAO, UNESCO, the World Bank, and the Dutch Ministry of Development Cooperation in all, almost all the uh, parts of the continent in the globe. Kenya, Sudan, Ghana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Turkey, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Costa Rica, Philippines, and India. Dr. Rowling is an author of two books related to international extension science. Recently, Dr. Rowling has been actively involved in investigating indigenous knowledge appropriate for sustainable development in third world countries. He is serving as a member of the uh, External Advisory Committee of CICAD. This visit is Dr. Rowling's second to Iowa State University. Previously, he delivered the seventh annual food lecture sponsored by the World Food Institute of ISU. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in, wel in welcoming Professor Niels Rohn. I know who I'm going to ask to be the next writer of my CV. <laughs> That's very certain. Uh, well, I'm equally pleased to be here, as you can imagine. Um, I'm. Uh, it's a, an overwhelming experience to, be, to enter the, what I call the C-card environment. And uh, Mary and Mike Warren are, of course, largely uh, to be blamed for that. But uh, so many other people have been making us very welcome, and I feel very happy to be here and very pleased. And as a result, I found myself trying to do a good job for tonight uh, since I've been having some more hospitality of Mike and, uh, and Mary. I'm not sure whether that will succeed. And they're entirely to blame if, if I wouldn't. Um, he mentioned I was here in 82 uh, for this uh, World Food Lecture. Uh, I came then and uh, the, what it did for me, that World Food Lecture, is to, is to allow me to travel to Hawaii where I, um, well, I enjoyed the food lecture too, but in addition, I got a little bit of money to travel to Hawaii, where an illustrious son of uh, this university um, organized a conference on knowledge, generation, exchange, and utilization. And I mentioned that because I'll be talking a little bit about it. But that conference, and uh, Dr. Abbott, uh, that's the first time we met uh, there, um, that conference, organized by George Beale, the rural sociologist, I think he has retired by now, uh, led to a book uh, called Knowledge, Generation, Exchange and Utilization. And um, that book, participating in the conference and in the book, has uh, really influenced me and it all indirectly also our department to take up that whole issue of knowledge utilization, which I consider a very important issue. And uh, I've gone so far now that I think that the study of human, the use of knowledge and the generation of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge is as important for our human survival as is ecology and as is economics and such subjects. So you can imagine that I'm also very interested in the whole area of indigenous knowledge, but this conference organized by George Beale was my first uh, real exposure to it. And uh, we met uh, all kind of people there, like uh, like um, Ronald Havelock, who was mentioned here earlier. 
Another guy was there was uh, Herbert Leinberger, one of the very first uh, students of this, and I'll, I'll come back to him just very briefly also. Okay, so that's my second reason why I'm very, very happy to be here. Third reason was, is, a, is one I have to explain a little bit. I always phone my mother on Sundays, you know, being on sabbatical. One is millions of miles away from my mother, and my mother is now 83, so I phone on Sundays. And she said, where, and, and she asked where I am, so I tried to explain this is Iowa, it's different from Ohio, you know. Don't try, I, I, want to be, I want to be different from who was it, Reagan or Johnson, who made this gaff. So I said, this is, uh, oh, she said, Ames. And uh, it happens that my father, in 1948, my father, who was a painter, you know, a painter of paintings like this, um, he didn't make very much money after the war, so he made a trip to the U.S. to find new markets for his paintings. And on the boat, he met a guy called Spedding, who was working here on atomic research or something, probably you know laying the foundations for the bomb. And um, they liked each other, and uh, my father was invited, so he got to he got to Ames and. As long as I remember, my mother has had a little Indian uh, corn cob, you know, lying on the on the on the you know chimney uh, mantel, and she said it's from Ames. Yeah, so, <laughs> so suddenly there was this connection with my youth. So that was very unexpected, but very interesting. Okay, so now you're used to my Dutch English, um, and I can go on. What I'd like to talk about a little bit is. Um, is mainly what I've learned myself during my sabbatical. Janice and I are on sabbatical. And uh, we have benefited an awful lot from, from being here in the US so far. And I've been working on an assignment for ISNAR, which is the International Service for National Agricultural Research. And ISNAR has a project called Research Technology Transfer Linkages, which in normal terms would be research extension linkages but the word extension is no longer very acceptable. So when Mike was saying uh, I'm an extension related somebody, I thought, oh my God, there's nobody going to show up tonight because it's dead. <coughs> the fact that you're all here means it's not so that. But anyway, in many international organizations, they're now using technology transfer as a more hard and better term. Well, we've heard a lot about the linear model and I'll say a little bit about it but it, it shows you that that is very much the kind of thinking in which this project started. Um, it has changed a lot during its, uh, its life, this project, although it still has the same name. A number of case studies were carried out in six countries as a part of this project and my specific task was to look at the nature of linkages on the one hand and the nature of technologies on the other under the assumption that the nature of that the type of technology would influence the type of linkage and vice versa. So that's what I've been looking at and I got very excited in the process and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's become a very interesting exploration actually. And so this uh, sabbatical after six years of, as head of department has I think done what it was supposed to do. Um, I will start up, uh, I'll start with um, with some of my uh, of the ideas that I have about the knowledge system and with that I want to go right back to where we were in 1989 and some of you have read I think a paper I did with uh, with Paul Engel in the Washington conference that uh, Mike organized together with the Academy for Educational Development and there we were also talking about knowledge systems so I want to start with that but I want to then continue uh, and share a little bit of the thinking that I think uh, I've developed during the sabbatical. And what I'd like to do very much is to, is to look at institutional configurations, at uh, knowledge processes, and at innovations. Look at those three things. And look at them from the point of view of how can we create an optimal environment, an optimal indigenous knowledge environment, an optimal environment for the creation, exchange, and utilization of indigenous knowledge. And that is what I will try and do. Now, I, I don't ever dare to compete with Janice in the nature of her beautiful uh, overhead sheet. So I've got this hopeless stuff here, and I've been threatened. I 
I should have better ones, but of course I'm not going to have better ones. I can't even find them. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I like to talk about. I'll start with just to please Mary with the case of Nigeria, and then I'll talk briefly about uh, this uh, uh, notion of knowledge systems. Then I'll talk a little bit more about num another number of case studies, and the idea behind that is to to um, show very different um, configurations that can occur in practice. And then I want to deal a little bit with concepts that I think are, are crucial for understanding the indigenous knowledge environment. I'm going to talk about some alternatives that come out of a completely different tradition just to, to blow your minds a little bit. And then I'd like to zoom in on, on, on what I think might be some relevant lessons for creating that uh, indigenous knowledge environment. So first, this case, TMS 30572. And that is um, a cassava variety, which was bred in Nigeria. What happened was this. In 1971, the IITA, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, started its root and tuber improvement program. And lo and behold, in 1972, cassava bacterial blight broke out. And some people even hinted there might be a connection. The devastation was very considerable. In 1973, in fact, it was very, very considerable, and people spoke of a national disaster. And therefore, in 1974, a national committee was called of the Root and Tubers Research Institute at Omudike, of the um, Moore Plantation, IITA was involved. It was really serious. You know, this was a serious crisis. And the decision was made to, re made to really attack this problem. And I must say that in 1976, a new variety was available for farmers, this variety. And the variety had a number of very important characteristics. It was resistant to bacterial blood. It was high yielding. It had a fantastic characteristic. It formed a very dense canopy. So it smothered all weeds growing underneath. So the researchers were very pleased to have done a fantastic job. And I must say that in so few years, you know, to have mobilized all this, this germ plasm and whatever and done this is quite an, quite an achievement. Um, there are a few problems. One is that cassava, which has been introduced many, many years ago in the country and is a, a major a new kind of crop which, which, which allows, uh, which has taken up the, pro which has solved the problem of, of decreasing soil fertility with increased population, decreasing uh, fallow periods, and therefore less suitable soils for yam, which is the main traditional crop in, in that part of the country. Cassava has done a magnificent job. So that's why it was such a disaster when this, this cassava blight struck. And, um, but yam, but the cassava is grown in, um, in mixed cropping. So here you have the IITA at, in the same year and I'll come back to that, that Baker and Norman discovered the value of mixed cropping, developing a crop which shades plants in the mixed cropping and has a very dense canopy, which means farmers must now plant wider apart. So it was an example of, um, of, much, of lack of attention, and I would call that lack of anticipation of technology need, lack of attention to the way farmers were farming. And as I, when I say um, it, is, it is ironic that this happened in the same year that Baker and Norman discovered mixed cropping. Baker and Norman were working from uh, the IAR, the Institute of Agricultural Research in Zaria, and they were struck by the fact that in all these years that IAR had been uh, promoting single cropping and row cropping, farmers had never taken it up around the research institute, so they went and did research. And they did a very seminal paper, I think it was in around 75, on the reasons why farmers were doing mixed cropping. And the reasons were that uh, you have different crops in the mix so that if it rains, this crop does very well. If it doesn't rain, that crop does very well. So you, you have your risks, you spread your risks. You get 
um, in, uh, diseases and insects don't spread as fast in this mixed crop. Labor allocation, which is a major problem in northern Nigeria, is optimally uh, distributed in such a mix. So instead of having these peaks, you kind of spread the labor. So from a labor point of view, the minimal factor was very well um, sp uh, distributed. And also in terms of money and economics, it turned out to be uh, better than single cropping. So in every respect, that research in 75 showed that mixed cropping was the thing. And in that same year, the cassava variety was developed, which had a dense canopy too. Yeah. So the people adopting that cassava variety at first were the larger farmers who grew cassava in single stands. But the devastation due to this, uh, this uh, virus was so bad, this uh, blight was so bad that it, it, the variety started to spread on its own. Now one of the things that is very exciting of interesting if you study the case is that after this major effort was done to create the new variety, there was no link with research. Research was never really informed, so there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any official effort to dis disseminate it. Worse, there wasn't any real effort to connect up with a vegetation, vegetative multiplication service. That only happened years later, about six, seven years later. So when you look at that case, you have a major crisis. You have a lot of people involved, a lot of intelligent people involved, and there are some very major problems. One is no anticipation of farmers' need or overlooking a ma major problem that farmers would have. Secondly, nobody is responsible for the end result. You know, the researchers have done their job. They feel good now. Extension is doing the rest. Nobody has really informed Extension. And I'm quoting, I'm using Ek, uh, Johnston Ekperi's research on this. And he says, you know, Extension didn't do anything because they weren't informed. The only people who were doing seed multiplication at the time was a shell kind of farming res or research agriculture program. There was no effort to really multiply because, and that would of course be the major bottleneck in the whole thing. So when you begin to look at this, you say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, major crisis, no real thinking through, nobody is responsible for the end result. Very interesting. Um, there is a major focus on research. There is no responsibility for the end result, no accountability for it, and no real anticipation of need. And nobody seems to be managing the whole process. So that is where, look, and, and this is just one case study which I picked, uh, you know, carefully and sensitively to uh, please Mary. Uh, I hope she still likes it after my uh, <laughs> having given it. Uh, but it's, not, it's just one example of very many. I'm looking at these case studies uh, that Isnar did, and there are quite a lot where these kind of things occur. And the funny thing is that you say, how is it possible that so many intelligent people, PhDs, international, Nigerian, whatever, the whole lot, you know, it doesn't add up to anything. Only years later do they take it seriously. So this kind of experience led us to say, hey, wait a minute, we must, we must begin to look at, at, this, at this whole process of research, extension, farmers, and so on, as a, uh, as a, from a systems perspective. And let me very briefly talk to you about the systems perspective, um, because uh, I think it is important as a start of what I really have to say. It's a perspective. So we're not looking at, at knowledge systems, as we call them, as things that really exist. We say, let's look at them as if they were systems. And maybe some of them aren't systems yet, see, but we have that perspective which provides us with a number of things that we wouldn't see otherwise. One is that we would look at it as a whole. So we say a knowledge system is a whole. And that means that the performance of the whole is important. See, it's not the performance of research, but the performance of the seed multiplication. No, it's the whole thing that makes sense. So we're looking at it as a whole. And the system as a whole has emergent properties. That is, it has properties which emerge if it becomes a system, and if it is more than a heap of spare parts. This is all you probably all had for most of you, but I just want to reiterate. You know, we're looking at research extension in the farm as not as a heap of spare parts, <coughs> but as potential a system uh, with emergent properties that will have, you know, a, 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 a performance more than 
all the individual benefits. So the word for that is synergy, but the token is more than the sum of the parts. And we say synergy has a number of very important aspects to it. One is a functional differentiation between the elements of the system. So one does this, the other one does that. And of course, in the beginning, we were very, very naive. We said research creates the knowledge, then extension transfers the knowledge, and finally use the knowledge. Well, after a little bit of thinking, me and my colleagues, and especially my colleagues, because I'm a little dense in this area, my colleagues said, hey, wait a minute, farmers are also doing research. And researchers are also utilizing knowledge. So it's not just users and creators of knowledge. You know, it's these processes are done better. But still, there is some <coughs> differentiation that takes place. And once you have that, you need an integration between these different functions. And you need to look at the linkages between these different issues. And that's what this project came out of, of course. Then the third thing, which we tend to forget, is that why would people link together? Why would researchers go to talk with extension? Well, that's bullish. That takes time. Extension workers are rather silly. You know, researchers have a nice house, they don't want to go to extension. And extension workers have better things to do than talk to researchers. And farmers have, you know, and so on and so forth. So what you need is some special forces to make sure that this thing becomes a system. And in our research, we found that the strongest element in creating the system is the pressure of farmers to get good service. That's the strongest all of And one of the things we discovered is that in the US and in the Netherlands and in Denmark and in France and all those places which are all subscribing to the model, the linear models that have been bashed uh, so much in this room, that at home they don't have a linear model at all. If you go to the US, it starts with the range. Before there's anybody else, the range, you know, the farmers go together and say, we want something. So all this nonsense of IATA talks to, to research in, 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 in Nigeria, and they talk to SMSs, and they talk to extension workers, and they talk to farmers. That wasn't the case in the US at all. So the whole model, you know, the model that we use in developing countries, we never use it ourselves. So, and that's where these kind of notions come in. And I think if you look at the research of the US system, the important thing, the word that the researchers use is articulation. Extension, farms, research, that's articulated system. Okay. Now, why I like the, the systems approach is it's an integrated uh, framework. There's many, many um, let's say, scientific perspectives that you can, um, you can integrate in this framework. It allows comparative analysis. Now, as I was saying to Mike and Mary, we've spent last uh, few days ago, we spent with Mike McNulty and his wife in uh, Iowa City. And the wife runs a child care center, a big one. And so as an experiment, I did a little analysis of the knowledge system supporting child care centers. And I tell you, that's not cheap. For you. Yeah. Two or three professional organizations, state level, national level, a different organization for the directors of child care centers and for the teachers, um, you know, special lobbies to make sure that the policies are in favor of the child care center, a few magazines supporting the whole of relationships with the parents. Um, you know, all the characteristics of the, of the knowledge system are right there. So I'm saying you can look at, at health and, and, and architecture and child care centers as a comparative, uh, you know, com to to look at these uh, at knowledge systems from a comparative perspective, and that's very exciting. Okay, but there is a very strong research tradition. I talked already a little bit about that, but uh, let's say this book that uh, George Beale wrote with a number of others and, uh, about that conference in 82 is just one of a whole series of books in the US, especially in the US, but also in Germany and other countries, about the utilization of knowledge. An important aspect of the knowledge, of, of the systems approach, is that it allows a diagnostic framework. Synergy is better than no synergy. An end product, some kind of performance of the whole system is better than each guy doing his own. See, so there is inbuilt in that approach, whatever way it goes, there is some kind of, of optimum, some kind of normative element there. So we like that very much because it allows us to do, we're taking a diagnostic approach. And in fact now a number of tools have been developed. One tool 
uh, that I want to mention is a tool developed at Illinois by an organization called Interfax, and they have developed something called the field methodology for the analysis of blah blah all story of, of knowledge systems. We ourselves in Wageningen, and especially my colleague Paul Engel, has developed a rapid appraisal for agricultural knowledge systems methodology. And it's really taking off. It's really a tool, you know, it's got it's got a manual and it's lays out how you can go about this. And so we're looking at the horse industry, and we're looking at the <coughs> mushroom industry, and it's, it's quite an interesting, and it allows you to, to identify gaps and problems and so on. So we're quite interested. Most of these tools are based on what I would call the soft systems methodology. The soft systems methodology was developed by, uh, and I think it's very interesting for, uh, for uh, the work that you, you guys are doing here, um, Yes. The soft systems methodology. Uh, I hope this is a bit visible. I, I, yeah, I didn't have really much time to, to make beautiful overheads, so I've pulled this out of my own paper. Then, right? um, the soft systems methodology is developed by Checkland, an Englishman, who said that hard systems are different from soft systems. Hard systems are like the Washington Underground, you know, where, which works more or less by itself, it's got very clear measurements, you can know, you know, there's, there's clear goals, there's feedbacks, there's hard measures of achievement of speed and so on and so forth. Well, as soon as people become, you know, people are not a system to begin with, people are just a bunch of people. And if they are a system, they are designed to be a system. And if you say a knowledge system is a heap of spare parts, and you want to make it into a system, then you must go through a process of making these people decide together to be a system, to have certain feedback and so on. So what, the, what this guy has done, checking, is to create a methodology which is based on years and years of trial and error as a, as a, as a, uh, a consultant to develop a methodology which he, which he calls his soft systems methodology, whereby he runs through a number of steps with the actors working, identifying the problem, trying to apply the system's perspective, uh, helping people to analyze the situation, why it doesn't gel into a system, coming back to the problem and deciding on action. So that methodology, I think, is a test methodology which is very helpful in our case, and in fact, our Prax uh, manual is very much based on this soft system Okay, I, that is what I wanted to say about the systems approach and um, the reason why I want to, to why I wanted to uh, to mention it is that uh, the systems approach for us is a point of departure that it isn't necessarily the um, the um, the uh, the end all, and what I'm, what I think I should say is that in my visit to the U.S. here, I have moved from thinking that the systems approach was really the end all of of my work to a new perspective. Let me give you now a number of examples, and I'm trying to look for my original overhead. I think it's. Uh, um, let me now uh, give you a number of examples of knowledge systems just to give you an idea of how different they are in terms of, and I'd like you to listen for that, in terms of the uh, nature of the institutions involved, the nature of the processes involved, and the nature of the innovations involved. Remember those three things that I mentioned. So let me give you those examples. First example is again from Nigeria. It is about the cola nut. The cola nut has been, um, had never been touched. And a, a, a Dutchman then decided to do something about the cola nut. The cola nut is a very interesting nut. It's a, it's a red, about this big, a red nut. And when you come into the house, the owner of the house will break the nut, will give you the nut to break. And then each person takes a little bite of the nut, it's bitter. And if he's very nice, he gives you a little bit of peanut butter and pili pili mixed up. And you eat it, and then that's a kind of creates a spirit of welcome. And get it. Am I saying it right, Mary? It's roughly something like that, is it? 
then drivers eat it because they want to stay awake. You know, it's got that kind of qualities too. So it's a kind of stimulant like coffee, I guess. The kola nut grows in the forest on trees. And what this researcher did, he went to the farmers and said, where is your best tree? What is your best tree and why? So he went to a number of farmers and got from each of these best trees uh, some seeds. And within a few years, with a very simple breeding program, he got the productivity of colonists up to 700% more than traditional. I asked him, by the hell, what is the use of that? <laughs> Which is a nasty question to ask, of course, because it has absolutely no use, because it's going to make all these poor farmers breadless, except for a few. But what it shows is that, you know, using, uh, that, in a, that using these knowledge of these farmers, you could really make a fantastic quick advance. In this case, I think it wasn't such a useful one, but still, an advance. And I'd like you to look at the, at the process, which is ra rather listening to farmers, consulting with them, um, you know, going to the field, the involvement, well, the, the, let's say the institutions involved was this researcher with a fairly simple training uh, program, and farmers. Okay, so that's one. Another example, next one, is the study clubs. In Holland, we have one, one of the most advanced forms of agriculture in Holland is glasshouse farming. And when I'm saying farming, I shouldn't say that. It's really very intensive type of, of agriculture. Pot plants, flowers, a lot of the flowers you buy here come out of the process, and uh, vegetables. We're competing with Colombia to be the importers into the US for flowers. And these guys, you would say, this is such an intensive thing. They need information on energy conservation, on varieties, diseases, you know, in those hothouses, there are lots of problems, and so on and so forth. It's very complicated, They're using computers and so on. The main form in which they receive and exchange knowledge is as follows. They have study clubs. And when I saw your farmers today, the practical farmers, it made me think of a study club in Holland. Because what it is, these guys come together they're, they're, they're part of a large organization, and the organization kind of creates little groups, that voluntary groups, who will meet one or two seasons around a problem. Let's say intensive pest management in a hothouse through biological controls. And they will spend two seasons looking at this. And what they do, they come to each other's hothouses, look at everything, books open, money, uh, energy, expenditure, everything is open, there's a lot of record keeping, so uh, you know, everything is available, and they talk together. Now, what is very interesting is how they look at this themselves. And it came out when the extension service was privatized. Our Dutch extension service, this whole story in itself, was privatized. And so then it was going to cost money. And then the, uh, the, the thing was, what is the function of the extension service in these study clubs? What they had been doing is to convene them to be the secretary. And the question was, what is the function of the... And the extension service itself wanted to be the technical input boys. You know, that's what the extension service wanted to be. And what the farmers said, what they, 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 these members of the... They said, no, no. We are... Every hothouse is an experiment station. We do our experiments, and in fact they do. We exchange a lot of information, and all we want extension to do is convene, be secretary, and create the opportunity. We can't pay for that. So that was very interesting. It shows you, again, if you look at process, innovation, and, 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 uh, and uh, the type of uh, institutions involved, there is the foundation of the farmers themselves, which organizes them. There's the study clubs. There's the extension worker as a facilitator. And, uh, and the processes are largely discussion, learning from each other, and so on and so forth. Okay, another example. This time in Kenya, agroforestry uh, project. Janice and I spent quite some time in uh, Cornell, and there we were very jealous about the quality of some of the PhDs. We haven't been long enough here to really get jealous, although I'm getting a little jealous already. But we stayed for four or five months in in Cornell, and we got very jealous of the quality of some of the PhD students that these guys there have, these colleagues of mine. And one of these uh, the PhD students was a lady of my age who'd been a manager of an agroforestry project in Kenya. And she's written it all up, and what, it, uh, what they did is very interesting. They achieved, they started in 83, 
And by 88, they had some 600 women's groups and uh, primary schools involved in nurseries. Uh, altogether, some 100,000 households were planting trees. They had 23 different, let's say, interventions, different forms of using trees. 36 species were involved. Altogether, 9 million seedlings were planted. And the thing was so successful that after one year, the response of the farmers was so enthusiastic that they had to change the whole planning of the project and go into a rapid implementation and all kinds of things, which maybe were not so good in the end, but that's what they did. None of the technologies they used underwent formal testing with, by research or anything like that. So what they did, they had a number of technologies which the farmers had already developed themselves, like hedge planting and a number of other things, which they disseminated because they had been tested sufficiently by farmers. Then a number of other technologies they weren't so sure about, but that's what they did. They said, this is the best bet. You guys go and test it yourselves. So they never told the farmers, here we know what, you know, you go and try and find out what's the best bet. So they did that, and um, of course what they, they installed as an institutional framework is a very careful evaluation of the experiences of these farmers so that they could call out the best, uh, or kind of collect the best uh, experiences and, you know, give out again. So that, again, a totally different approach. I must say that one of the interesting things about this project is the calls, uh, the, 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 let's say, the uncertainty with which this woman, who had been the manager, looked at this whole thing. She said, research is not involved. Science is hardly touching this. You know? How can we really proceed? You know, it's very unfair to the farmers if we don't have science doing this. You know? In other words, the farmers can't, you know, it, it's a bit tricky to let them decide themselves. Um, and another thing was that because of the tremendous success, it wasn't so easy to keep up that careful evaluation which was necessary. Nevertheless, as a model, I think it's very interesting to think about that case. Now, the last case I want to mention is <coughs> a case from Gujarat, India. Just to please you, you know, I'm a, I'm a heel licker, first order. Um, and this is about uh, a scheduled caste, the Vankars who um, have always been weavers, but uh, traditional weavers, but who moved to agriculture. And um, these guys uh, and women, but I think the men were doing most of the agriculture initially, were farming on very salt land, extremely salt land. So what they did is uh, they had developed a certain taxonomy of the soils, like M Mike has been talking about these things. You know, they knew about, let's say, El El um, um, salt soils, but then there was also a soil with very high pH, which they knew the difference between those things and so on. So they had this, developed a certain amount of, of uh, indigenous knowledge. And uh, what this uh, NGO, which worked with, with them, did was to work with them on the development of tree planting for commercial charcoal production. And um, the NGO developed, noticed that it would be impossible to utilize this land if it wouldn't be consolidated. So then they formed cooperatives to consolidate the land. And uh, secondly, they, um, they also uh, began to look at the risks involved in working together. Now, the risks involved natural risk, it wouldn't maybe work, involved their own collaboration. Could they trust the others? Would the thing break up because somebody would run with the money? It involved risk of higher castes and officials who would be, you know, steal things, and, you know, the whole thing. So all these risks and everything. And in the end, they accepted this NGO and said, if you agree to stay with us for 10 years, and if you provide us a loan, which if it doesn't work, we don't have to pay back, and if you handle our money, you see? Under those conditions, they agreed to work together. So they had this, this, co this cooperative. So each town was a cooperative, and in each town, they had experimental plots. So they worked in each of these towns how to grow these trees and these seedlings in this very soil, s salt soils. And just let me give you an example of one of the bits of research they did. They, <coughs> at one time, there was a big discussion about, about the role of irrigation. And some of them had fields that had been, where they had made a little bun and a little canal. And in others, they had the flat fields. So here they had planted the, the seedlings. 
And here they had planted the seedlings like that. So then one guy said, we had bad experiences with irrigating this area. And, uh, and people were actually a big discussion. So then they did an experiment and they irrigated uh, this uh, land and found out what the difference was. Well, the difference was if you had the salt over here, the irrigation just pushed, pushed all the salt down. So this was fine. What happened here was that the water in this little channel pushed the salt down there, but when it began evaporating after the irrigation up here, and this poor thing died. So that's the kind of micro salt management that these people got involved with. Formal research, zilch. When they went to formal research, most of the recommendations didn't really work. You know, so this kind of stuff, these guys work together. Then they formed an APEX organization in these co for, of these cooperatives and uh, worked out a methodology uh, for working together in one experiment station. And that experiment station would be the place where would, they would discuss their experiences, do their collective research and so on, studies, experimentation. So again, a very crucial factor is discussion, uh, bargaining, working together, and so on. Okay, so now um, I've given a number of uh, cases. I see I've messed up my uh, my um, beautiful outline, but I now want to talk briefly about some concepts for uh, indigenous uh, knowledge. And I think I'm going to use these case studies to kind of emphasize again some main issues that I see as important for indigenous knowledge. One is the, um, and let me just give this uh, the first part here. One is, as I said, that I see as very crucial coming out of this that one must look at not just the innovation, the outcome. And if I may be a bit critical, I think sometimes in the enthusiasm of people about indigenous knowledge, the emphasis is on what great things can be achieved with additional knowledge. So that is the desired innovation. But I think we must also look at the knowledge process and the institutional configuration, and the three seem to hang together. Because the type of innovation and the type of process and the type of, uh, of institutional configuration seem to require a certain consistency. Now, if I, if I give you the most famous type of consistency, it is where, where um, the desired innovation is a variety, like I gave you the example of the, the sample, where the knowledge process is transferred, and where the institutional configuration, and I'm going to quote my, uh, my mentor, my, my mentor, my man I respect tremendously, but I, I think I've now outgrown his ideas, uh, Herbert Leinberger, who said that as follows? He said, We are dealing with the institutional calibration of the science practice continuum. So just visualize it. I, that if there's one phrase that convinced me to look at knowledge systems, that's what it is. The science practice continuum. It starts with science, and then there is a continuum, and all that continuum we calibrate by fundamental research, adaptive research, specialists, extension workers, farmers, practice. Now that model is so ingrained in all of us. It's a linear model we've been talking, I won't talk much about it because we've all been talking about it. But that is the model that we've been using. And it's consistent, all right. And what I'm saying, I think we can look at the same consistency with the same system approach, but at a very different kind of model. So what I like to do is to say, now what kind of combination of these three would be required in the case of indigenous knowledge. And to be specific, would be required to provide an optimal environment for generation, share, and utilization of indigenous knowledge. And that's what I'd like to do. And of course, I, I, I don't think I'll be very successful. I won't have the last word but, uh, on that. But at least I'm going to make a try and, and create a few ideas on this subject. One of the points that I'm going to do first is to mentioned two alternative alternative models just to to give you an idea of how different we can think about these things and for some of you this might be old hat but 
I doubt it because for myself uh, these models were quite new and interesting. The first one is the chain, the chain lift model. Now that phrase was coined by two guys called um, Klein and Rosenberg, by the way. I've got a slightly different version of this paper. Um, Mike has a copy, so if anybody is interested, Mike has the copy, and in there are the references to people that I've been uh, referring to. Very little of this is original, of course. All I've done is put this together. So these uh, Klein and Rosenberg have been summarizing the uh, research on commercial innovation. Now, that is an area of research we agriculturalists don't look at too often. Yet, a very interesting one, because what has happened, since I did my PhD anyway, is that Japan has taken over as the world leader and the most competitive producer of uh, industrial goods. And this has created a number of shockwaves in the US and other Western countries, so that all kinds of research centers have been set up. How the hell is this possible? Hmm? We, with our research, our advance, our in this, that. Japanese don't have anything. They don't have very much research or, or fundamental basic research. They don't. But they're much better at making Walkmans, cars, anything you want to mention. So that led to a lot of research. And um, what Klein and Rosenberg did is to look at this. And one of the interesting things is that they debunk the linear model even more than you guys do here. So quite interesting to get some fresh ideas on how to debunk the linear model. So I may give you a hint. Uh, one thing that comes out of it is, uh, is technology is not applied science. In fact, what they find in industry, and this is very interesting for, indi uh, for, for indigenous knowledge, is that much of research is fed by technology development. So technology development is a different process from research. And there are all kinds of ways in which research benefits from technology development. And technology development doesn't come from researchers. No, it comes from all kinds of people, customers, workshop managers, floor guys with helmet, blue helmets, how you call these guys, you know, those kind of people. And so it's very important uh, uh, experiences and research they have in this area. And what they say is, <coughs> in, in that model, and I'll show you the model, is that um, <coughs> basically uh, they say that uh, research